Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. You might notice you've been lured here under false pretenses because the title I have up here is the Gospels Factual Section, which I just wanted to look at a slightly narrower topic, but if you want to bring up anything about the Bible in Q&A, that's fine. Remember about Q&A, there's sometimes more Q than A, but that's okay. Right, let's have a look at uh, how we might begin looking at this subject. I want to begin with some non-Christian sources about the origins of Christianity. The reason I do that is some of you uh, may be more skeptical about what Christians say about how Christianity began, and so I want to make some sort of fixed points. Of course, most of the early sources about Christianity, the beginnings of Christianity, are by Christians, just like most things written about golf are by golf enthusiasts. That's what you should expect. But we can make some fixed points based on what non-Christians say. So I want us to begin with a man called Tacitus, who was a Roman historian, <coughs> born uh, in Rome, living in Rome, around the year AD 64, when there was a great fire in Rome, started probably by the emperor Nero, a bit of a mad guy, and Nero feared that he'd become less popular, so he decided to blame the Christians for having started the fire. Now, Tacitus was just a young boy at the time uh, when this took place, probably only aged eight, but he's someone that, as a historian, people trust for uh, things that he wrote, uh, written about that were... Decades before he was born, he was the first person, in fact, to talk about lochs in Scotland. Uh, and, of course, that was a very long way from where he was living. So he's someone that we can uh, usually rely on. He's also quite cynical about Christianity, as you'll see. And this is what he says about the beginnings of Christianity and this great fire. For neither help by humans nor generous gifts from the emperor, nor all the ways of placating heaven, could stifle the scandal or dispel the belief that the fire had taken place by order. That's order of Nero. Therefore, to scotch the rumour, Nero uh, substituted his culprits and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty a class of men loathed for their vices, whom the crowd called Christians. Now, we're just going to pause there and notice that the crowd calls this group of people Christians. There are three occurrences of the word Christian in the New Testament, all outside of language. So just as the word Methodist was first used by non-Methodists and then applied to Methodists, I'm being careful about this, um, and then... Uh, that Methodists applied it to themselves, and the word Quaker was first applied as outsider language to Quakers, and then subsequently Quakers applied it to themselves. We have the same with the word Christian. Now, the word Christian implies the word Christ, which is the equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah. So if we have a group called Christians, they seem to be a group who believe that the Jewish Messiah has come. He then continues, Christus, that's Latin for Christ, the founder of the name had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius. Now, Tiberius was emperor from the year 14 to the year 37. So that gives us a sort of um, time frame for when it all began. By the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate, someone mentioned in the New Testament, and someone who we know from other sources was governor of Judea from the year 26 to the year 36. In other words, that gives us quite a narrow time frame for when um, Christ was put to death, somewhere between the year 26 and the year 36. And the pernicious superstition was checked for a moment, uh, only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, but in the capital, Rome in itself, where all things horrible and shameful in the world collect and become unfashionable. So there we have his own view of his own town. But notice that he talks about how Christianity began in Judea, uh, and that's, of course, exactly what the Christian writings say about where Christianity began. So uh, he then continues <coughs> and talks about how Christians were arrested. First then, the confessed members of the sect were arrested. Next, on their disclosures, vast numbers were convicted. Not so much on the count of arson as for hatred of the human race. Which is something, of course, people say now about Christians today as well. And derision accompanied their end. They were covered with wild beast skins and torn to death by dogs, or they were fastened on crosses, and when daylight failed, were burned to serve as lamps by night. Now, all I want to establish at this point is some of the details you'd find in the New Testament and the fact that there were a great number of Christians in Rome. So he talks about vast numbers. Here we are about 30 to 35 years after Christianity began. We have a very large number of Christians in Rome, and they seem to be suffering for it. Now, what we must do is make an inference from martyrdom to truth. The fact that people are martyred for a belief does not mean it's true. But martyrdom does at least usually show that the belief is sincere. 
And the fact that such a large number of people are dying for a belief and that uh, they have sp the belief has spread so far does at least put some limits on some versions of how Christianity began. What I mean by that is the fact that Christianity spread so far would suggest that there was some sort of Christian message in order to spread up front. Moreover, if you want to start changing the Christian message 10, 20, 30 years after it's begun, the difficulty you have is that Christians are spread so far across the Mediterranean. That means it becomes much harder to innovate. So that gives you the basics of where uh, Christianity spread from Judea to Rome. I want to take another source, this one writing about 80 years after the beginnings of Christianity. This is someone called Pliny the Younger writing to the emperor um, Trajan and uh, um, asking for advice as to how to deal with uh, Christians. And he talks about what he's been doing. And he says, I interrogated these people as to whether they were Christians. If they confessed, I interrogated them a second and a third time. By the way, these sources can be found anywhere on the internet. So, you know, just go and look at them and uh, get the Latin text as well. If they, uh, I, so I interrogated them a second and a third time, threatening punishment. If they persisted, I ordered them to be led off, which means led off to execution. As for those who denied that they were or ever had been Christians, when they invoked the gods in work by me and prayed with incense and wine offerings to your statue, which I had ordered to be brought for this very purpose, along with the images of the gods and also cursed Christ, which is said that no true Christian can ever be compelled to do, I thought this would be discharged. Well, that's very generous of him. He's a, a, a kind man. And he's only going to kill those who persist as Christians. If you renounce the faith, that's all right, you can keep your life. So he's really trying to plough that moderate course rather than just kill every Christian, I suppose. Um, one of the things he wants to do is test whether people are real Christians. I find this phrase, um, which is said that no true Christian can ever be compelled to do, a fascinating one. Because here we have a non-Christian distinguishing between Christians in name only and uh, true Christians, which it must be a distinction he heard from people he interrogated, which is a fascinating idea to me, because I think it's still something very relevant today, the idea of a true Christian and one in name only. But he has a number of tests for whether someone is a Christian, and they are tests as to whether you're prepared to worship the emperor, worship the Roman gods, and so on. The logic of these tests is, of course, that Christians have kept up with that Jewish belief. Jews only worship one God. And so it seems to be that the Christians have kept up that idea that you only worship one God. That's why you can't just worship Roman emperors and <coughs> Roman gods. Romans, of course, on the other hand, when you ask how many gods do Romans have, the answer is many. Uh, there isn't quite a, a limit. You know, the way the Greeks and the Romans work was rather like Percy Jackson. You know, Zeus or Jupiter can look down from the sky, uh, see a pretty girl, get together with her, and you get another half god. So the numbers can just keep on going up. On the other hand, for Jews, there's a mathematical limit on the number of gods you can have. You can only have one. So there is this interesting logic to the test. The test is, in order to show whether someone's a Christian or not, are they prepared to worship other beings? And we'll come back to that. He then talks about a dossier which denounced some people as Christians. Others <coughs> named in the document said that they were Christians, but later denied it, saying that they had been. But they'd ceased three years ago, or many years ago, or even as much as 20. Now here, the governor uh, of uh, northwest Turkey, who's writing, Pliny, was governor sometime between the year 111 and 113. So we could split the difference and say it's the year 112. Now he's writing about what people tell him who had renounced the Christian faith. These people tell him about what went on in Christian meetings before they renounced the Christian faith. And here they describe meetings as they were three years ago, or many years ago, or even as much as 20. Now, if I take 20 from 112, I get back to somewhere in the first century, don't I? And so I think what we have here is a description of what went on in first century Christian meetings as given by people who had renounced the Christian faith. And this is what they said. They said that this had been the full extent of their guilt or error as Christians. They had been accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn. Of course, it's very erroneous to meet that early, but there we are. And to sing antiphonally, that's one group to another, a song to Christ as to a God, and to bind themselves by an oath not to some crime, but rather not to commit theft, robbery, or adultery, not to break their trust, and not to refuse to return a pledge when asked to do so. So you can see a certain emphasis on what the Christians are on about, and this is, remember, the governor of northwest Turkey writing to the emperor in Rome about Christians 
and describing this as the content of their meeting. The great emphasis on truth. Now, of course, an emphasis on truth does not prevent lies from spreading within an organisation, but it does um, actually work against lies. So we know organisations that emphasise truth but have lies within them, but I would say at least it does um, uh, mitigate, uh, uh, militate against uh, having lies. The interesting thing for he me here is that they sing a song to Christ and to a God. Now this is a text written in Latin. Did anyone here studying Latin? Okay, we've got a few people studying Latin. Wonderful. Okay, a simple question for those studying Latin. What is the Latin word for A? Ah, the indefinite article. It doesn't exist. Perfect, madam. That's exactly the right answer. There is none. In other words, whether the phrase quasi Deo, as if to a God, as to a God, singing Christ quasi Deo, is to a God or to God, we can't actually say on the basis of the Latin. But what we can say is there's a very interesting logic. Because we've already seen that Christians are, can be identified by their unwillingness to worship Roman gods. In fact, they're unwilling to worship the emperor because it seems they've inherited that Jewish idea, because the word Christian is an inherently Jewish idea. It's Christ is to do with Messiah. So that's, that's the idea. But we see that the logic of it is you don't worship other beings. And here they are singing to Christ treating him as divine. Now I'd want to suggest that this tells us something rather interesting. The way some people would suggest that Jesus came to be viewed as God is rather the Dan Brown method. Dan Brown suggests that after about three centuries, um, uh, through political power and the Ro uh, Roman Emperor Constantine having been converted to Christianity, they sort of upgraded Jesus from a human to a God. Another way that some people view it is really that at first, Jesus was a very special human, viewed as a very special human, then he was viewed as a very, very special human, then a very, very, very special human, and then halfway to God, three quarters of the way to God, and eventually all the way. The problem about that is really there isn't a developmental pathway which doesn't break the Jewish mathematical rule that you only ever have one God at a time. That means you cannot have one and a half gods. In fact, one of the things we know about God is he is the only one you worship. One of the Ten Commandments says, God is the only one you could worship. So it's quite basic for Jews and anyone following on from the idea of Judaism that you only have one God. And so if they are all worshipping Christ, it seems that somehow they've begun to identify Christ as the Jewish God. That's what's actually gone on. And that's quite a striking idea that we have. So it hasn't come as a very late development. In fact, it's attested fairly early in a non-Christian source. He then talks about how many people of every age and of every rank and of both sexes are being and will be called to trial. Nor is it only the cities that are, are affected, but the disease of this superstition is also reaching villages and farmsteads. He says, optimistically, it seems possible to check and correct this. <coughs> it's pretty well agreed that the temples, which had almost become deserted, have now begun to be frequented again. And all the sacred rites, which had been neglected for a long time, are recommencing, and the flesh for sacrificial rites is being sold, for which up to now it was hard to find a purchaser. So here we have the governor of northwest Turkey He's saying that so many people in his area have become Christians that it's the, the temples are almost deserted, and it's hard to find people to buy sacrificial meat. So you can check that out on the web. But I think it's a rather striking claim, because the, far, um, the faster Christianity spreads, the harder it is to have a huge amount made up at a later stage. I think it's a bit like changing a PR campaign halfway through. Also, he seems to suggest it's rather difficult being a Christian. So uh, that's where our second friend, uh, Pliny, is based. I want to come to a third non-Christian source. The first two we've looked at are Gentiles, Roman writers. This one is a Jewish writer writing in Greek. The first two were in Latin. And here we have a uh, talk about what happened in a power vacuum when, in AD 61 or 62, the um, governor of Judea, there was no governor of Judea, and so the high priest, the Jewish high priest, decided to uh, seize control, and this is what happened. He, that's Ananus, the Jewish high priest, assembled a Sanhedrin of judges and brought before it the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others, and when he had made an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he handed them over to be stoned. So the people who are dying for the, their Christian belief are not just people who are hundreds of miles away, also very, people very close up. 
according to early Christian sources, James, the brother of Jesus, was a leader in the early church. And I do think it's a rather striking thing. Um, I don't think I could get my brothers to die for religious belief in me. Uh, they might, well, you know, die to look after me, but not for that sort of thing. So I think that's a rather striking uh, detail. And basically we find that the agreement between non-Christian sources and Christian sources is that Christianity spread far and fast, and it was rather difficult being a Christian. So much for the non-Christian sources. I now want to come on to Christian writings, but let's begin with uh, looking at how we would know whether these texts are reliable. Well, one of the things that we can do is we can ask whether the Christian writings, particularly the Gospels, know the time and place they're writing about. So this is my very first time in UNC, absolutely delighted to be with you. But there are certain things I didn't know before coming here about your culture and about the way things are done and your, you know, that your fire engines would be like blue and so on. Uh, there, there, there are things that I just wouldn't know. Uh, and what happens if you start writing a story about a place that you've never been is that you very easily come um, a cropper, you uh, make all sorts of elementary mistakes. So we can start asking, when we look at the gospel writers, do they know the shape of buildings? Do they know the plants that are growing? Do they know the social stratification? And so on. Let's uh, look at how we can uh, test this out by looking at what people were called. Um, one of the things we can do is we can actually look at the names that Jewish um, men and women were given outside the New Testament, because there are many bone boxes which give you names and historians, people like Josephus or the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you can get together some interesting data. We find there are about 3,000 names which survive from the right time period, and we can study what proportions these various names occur in. And we find that Jewish names outside the land of Palestine are rather different from Jewish names inside the land, and yet there is a basic correlation between what you get in the Gospels and what you get outside, uh, sorry, um, outside the Gospels in local records. So if I can just give you um, a bit more detail on that. What we find in um, outside the Gospels is that the top two men's names are Simon, the most popular name, and Joseph, the second most popular name. If I look inside the Gospels, I find exactly the same pattern. Now, the four Gospels of the Book of Acts, which are uh, here considered in the data, are five different books written by four different writers. And yet, overall, between them, they show a spread of names which is very comparable to the material you would find outside the New Testament. So, outside the New Testament, you'd find between 15 and 16 percent of men had one of those names. And uh, inside the New Testament, you find about 18 percent. Is this going to work better? Is that a hit? Is it's very, very directional, this thing. Okay, I'm going to try and be careful not move. No, that isn't going to work. <laughs> Is it okay when it's not going to work? Let's go to the hand. Okay. A lot of Right, good evening, everyone. Is this on? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Great. Um. <laughs> That one needs to be off. Didn't be off. Okay. And no, no, no. Okay. I think it's like this. Right. Well, good evening, everyone. We will start that talk again, shall we? Did you hear any of that? <laughs> so outside, we find about 15% of names have these, uh, uh, of, of men's names were Simon and Jeff in the New Testament, about 18%. Outside the Gospels, about 41% of men had the top nine names. Inside the Gospels, about 40%. Now, the interesting thing about that is that we're dealing with data that's a lot, lot closer. I mean, we've got a larger data sample. We find that as the data sample gets larger, the statistics between outside the Gospels and inside the Gospels gets much closer. With women, there's a little bit less imagination about what to call people, I'm afraid. Uh, so we find that most popular woman's name outside the Gospels is Mary, and also inside the Gospels. About 29% of women outside the Gospels were called Mary or Salome. Inside the Gospels, about 39%. And about half of women had one of those two names. And there's a squidge on my slide. Sorry about that. But when we consider the names that people had inside the Gospels, and we consider them relative to the data from the land, we find that names inside the Gospels are rather different from... Uh, the names that we'd have if we went down to Egypt. There are many Jewish men in Egypt, and they generally have different names from Jewish men in Palestine. And I find that that's a rather striking thing. 
And this isn't working very well, is it? But there we are. Um, well, no one's going to rescue me. I will just blunder on. Um, so, we have, when we look at, in Jewish men in Egypt, we find some rather popular names like Sabbatius, or the Scythians, or Pappas, or Ptolemaeus. We find those as the really popular names. Whereas inside uh, Palestine, we find that they were rather different names indeed. So we can say that there's a striking correlation between what you get in the Gospels and what you get outside the Gospels. Now, our friend, uh, many of you will know, uh, Bart Ehrman, uh, suggests that uh, Gospels were probably written outside of Palestine. So I find it interesting that they are giving the right sort of names for people inside Palestine. And there's a little bit more to it. See, if Simon is the most popular name, you call out Simon and it becomes deeply ambiguous because there are so many Simons around. So what you find the gospel doing is not only using the right names, but using disambiguators in the right places. Let me explain. Because there are so many Simons, when there is a Simon, you often need to distinguish one Simon from another by adding something. You might give the father's name, the, where they come from, the job they do. Something about that. And so we find Jesus has 12 disciples, two of whom have the name Simon. One is called Simon Peter, or Simon Cephas. The other is called Simon the Zealot, or Simon the Canaanite, who carries Jesus... Jesus is crossed in the Gospels, he's described as Simon of Cyrene. In the book of Acts, you meet someone called Simon the Tanner, or leather worker. In Matthew's Gospel, you meet someone called Simon the Leper, who isn't a leper because people are sitting around having a meal with him. But that um, name does distinguish him from other Simons. You find the same with Mary. Mary Magdalene, or Mary the mother of James and Joseph, would be names that you'd find within the Gospels. The most common names get these disambiguators, and the other ones don't. And I find this a rather striking pattern, because if I were making up stories outside the land, I simply wouldn't know which names I need to disambiguate. But that is the sort of pattern we get regularly in the Gospels. And there's a further thing we could say about that, and that is that usually names are very hard to remember. Does anyone here find it hard to remember names? No? There's one person who doesn't. But several people do. And what we find is names are hard to remember because there's often no logical connection between a name and a person. It's a pretty arbitrary label. Sometimes there's no logical reason why they should have it. Sometimes there are logical reasons why they shouldn't have that name, but that's a question for their parents. The point is this, that we find it hard to remember names. Often we'll be in a social function, and we can remember lots of things about the person on the other side of the room. We know where they come from, what they drive, how many brothers and sisters they've got, and we know the last conversation we had with them. We just can't remember that vital piece of information, namely their name. Why is that? That is because names are hard to remember, and yet stories are easy to remember. We watch a film, we remember the stories, we forget the names of the minor characters, sometimes even of the major characters. So it's rather striking to me that the Gospels have got, correctly got, the sort of detail that's the hard stuff to remember. If they can get the hard stuff to remember right, isn't there every reason to think they can get the other things right? Now we can also come to a control sample. If we compare the four Gospels we have in the New Testament with apocryphal Gospels, which some conspiracy theorists would want to tell us are very important, one of the things we find is that they really do not do very well at all on popular names, giving the right names for the time and place. There's something called the Gospel of Mary, and the big question we don't even know is which Mary is this supposed to be? That was the most popular of all women's names. Is it Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus? Who knows? The Gospel of Judas, which came out a few years ago at Easter, um, and, you know, having been hidden in a Swiss vault for many years, how many correct names from the town and time and place does it have? Well, it's got the name Judas, and it's got the name Jesus, and then it's got a whole load of figures from outer space in terms of their names, like Barbalo and Harmathoth and so on. Not the right sort of name for the time and place. So these show to us what happens when people are making up stories some way away from the time and place. We can then go to look at the name test in a little bit more detail by looking at Matthew's Gospel. This is the first of the four uh, Gospels as you meet it in the New Testament. And here we have the list of the 12 disciples of Jesus as given in Matthew's Gospel. But I have added next to the name, if that name is in the top 99 names, for Jewish Palestinian males. And what we find is when it's a higher ranking name, it's got a disambiguator, and when it's not, it hasn't. 
So here we begin, Simon ranked number one with a disambiguator called Peter, and Andrew not ranked, but just explained in relation to his brother, Andrew his brother. James ranked number 11, high ranking, the son of Zebedee, and John his brother. Then we have two low ranking names, Philip and Bartholomew, 61st and 50th equal respectively. Thomas not even on the charts, and none of those have disambiguators. Then we have Matthew, who's high ranking, and called the tax collector. James, high ranking, the son of Alpheus. Thaddeus, low ranking, 39th equal, and no disambiguator. And Simon, high ranking, called the Cananean. And Judas, high ranking, called Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now I know there are other things going on in that list, but the striking thing for me is a correlation between whether there is a disambiguator on the name and name data that have only been known for the last 15 years. That to me is a very striking thing because it suggests to me that this list is a list that actually was formed in the land. If you had been writing away from the land and simply making up a list of, uh, of Jesus' disciples, why would you bother having disambiguators which would not be needed away from the land? We can find even conversations in the Gospels recorded in a rather striking way. Take the name John. John was a very common name. It was the fifth most common name. Which means when you have someone like John the Baptist, the reason he's called the Baptist is not just because he baptizes people, but also to distinguish him from lots of other Johns. Now there's a, a figure called Herod in the Gospels who believes that Jesus might be John the Baptist come back from the dead. He happened to have beheaded John the Baptist. And so we have a flashback in Matthew chapter 14. And Herod says, when he hears of Jesus, he says to his servants, this is John the Baptist. Now it's striking that he says John the Baptist because he can't just say to his servants, this is John. Because his servants might just have asked, which John? We've got several Johns working in the palace at the moment, which one do you mean? So he says this is John the Baptist. He speaks as a character in that time and place would have had to have spoken. However, the narrator simply speaks about John plainly. Because when you're reading through the narrative, it's very clear which person you're talking about. However, Herodias' daughter, who wants to have John the Baptist's head, uh, doesn't just say, give me the head of John, she might have got the head of the wrong John. So she says, give me the head of John the Baptist. But then in the very next verse, we read that he, that's Herod, went and beheaded John. So in other words, the characters in the narrative speak in exactly the sort of way that someone in that particular land would have had to have spoken at that time, but not how someone would have had to have spoken outside the land. Now, this does not mean that I can prove that these are the exact words that people say. But I can say it's a pattern which is consistent with having a knowledge of exactly how people do speak in that land. You might want to say it's a very clever narrator who's distinguishing between characters in the narrative and the narrative itself. Fine. But let's say that the cleverer we allow the narrator to be, the harder it is to say that they got the story wrong through basic incompetence. We can also say that the same pattern occurs about the name Jesus. And I'm rather pleased with this because I discovered it. Um, and uh, it's a fairly, you know, to discover something fairly basic about the Gospels that no one seems to have noticed for about 2,000 years, I was quite pleased with myself. But you can go home and check this, and basically this is the pattern. Well, let's start with how many words there are per Gospel. Um, it seems that Luke is the longest Gospel, and Mark is the shortest Gospel. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can find them anywhere on the internet, or you can get a Bible if you look. Um, you can then say, well, how many times is Jesus mentioned in each gospel? We find John has the most mention of Jesus and Mark uh, the fewest mentions. That doesn't mean, of course, that uh, John is more about Jesus than the other ones. But we can say, but of course, Mark is the shortest. So why don't we look at mentions of Jesus per thousand words and we find that Luke has the fewest, not because he's less about Jesus, but because he's more inclined to say he did this, he did that, he did the other. It's his narrative style. Now that's just in order to show you uh, that these four different authors, and everyone from skeptic to believer believes that they're four different authors, um, these four different authors use the name Jesus differently. Now I'm going to show you how I discovered that they use Jesus, the name Jesus in the same way. Because what we find is Jesus is actually quite a common name for the time and place. It's a form of the name Joshua. There are other Jesuses in the New Testament. There's someone called Bar Jesus. There's someone called Jesus, called Justice. So what happens is, if you were just saying Jesus is walking down the street, the question at the time of Jesus' ministry would be, which Jesus are you talking about? 
So what we find is that normally in a narrative in the Gospels, you just talk about Jesus. And if you've got to Matthew chapter 21 and don't know which Jesus you're reading about, you need to start reading it again and pay more attention. <laughs> but what happens, it, you find that the characters in the narrative disambiguate the name Jesus. So the crowds say this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. So he's a prophet and they give his, the, exactly where he came from in order to explain who he is. And yet the me next mention of Jesus is simply Jesus went into the temple. So the narrator speaks about Jesus. The characters in the narrative speak about Jesus plus disambiguator. And you go on. In Matthew's Gospel, this is a time when the chief disciple Peter denies Jesus Christ. And the previous occurrence of the word uh, is just simply Jesus. But then the servant girl comes up to him and says, This man, uh, you were with Jesus the Galilean. A slightly more clued up servant girl says, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. But the very next mention of Jesus is, um, Peter remembered the saying of Jesus. You see? So the characters speak one way, and the um, narrator speaks another way. Or when Pontius Pilate is talking to the Jewish uh, crowd saying, whom do you want me to release for you? He doesn't say, do you want me to release for you Barabbas or Jesus? He says, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ. He says that again. Um, even an angel, allegedly, at the tomb, and you may not believe in angels or uh, resurrections, but we'll come on that later, um, seems to disambiguate. We have the same going through Mark's gospel. Every time we have Jesus in speech marks, in a crowd setting, we have um, a disambiguator on the name Jesus, whether it's Jesus of Nazareth, or son of David, Jesus, something about his genealogy. We could go to Luke's Gospel. And we find, again, disambiguators every time we come across him. I rather like this one in chapter 18. Because here we have a disambiguator outside speech. And you might say, well, that beats the pattern. But in fact, it follows the pattern because they talk to a people, uh, someone who's blind, and they told this man, Jesus the Nazarene is passing by. In other words, it's reporting the content of speech. And so it has a disambiguator, and then he calls out saying, Jesus, son of David. Now, you might think there are two exceptions. One is there is a thief who turns to Jesus on the cross, allegedly, in uh, Luke chapter 23, and doesn't say Jesus of Nazareth, doesn't use a disambiguator, but this is not a crowd set setting, and of course, this is a one-to-one -one conversation. People on crosses don't waste words. <laughs> allegedly, Jesus appears to a couple of disciples after his death, resurrected, they're walking along the road, and uh, they say to him, have you heard the things that are going on? And he says, what things? Because they haven't yet recognized him. And he says, the thing, uh, they say the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. The same in the fourth gospel, John's gospel. Uh, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Um, or Jesus, the son of Joseph. The second supposed exception might be in chapter 9, where a man who's um, supposedly been born blind has supposedly been healed. And in this uh, situation... The people say to him, well, who healed you? And he just says the man called Jesus. But I think this narrative is actually portraying him as only semi-knowing at that point. And so I think it fits the same pattern. When people go to arrest Jesus, they say, he says, whom are you seeking? And they reply, Jesus of Nazareth, twice. So in other words, we have a disambiguator. Now, if the Gospels were written long, long after Christianity was around, you would not need to disambiguate. Now, I happen to like the name Jesus, but I want to give a comparison with a less nice name. Let's take the name Adolf. In 1850, if you're in Germany and you say the name Adolf, no one bats an eyelid. I mean, who's Adolf? I mean, there are lots of Adolfs around. It's a very common name. If you say the same name in 1950, uh, automatically people think of one particular person. Now, I think you'd have the same thing as Christianity arises. As Christianity spreads far and fast, Christianity was spread all around the Mediterranean, as we saw earlier, that when you talk about Jesus, automatically people are thinking about one particular Jesus. So the fact that the Gospels disambiguate at this point suggests to me that they're rather concerned. Um, it's the sort of pattern you would get when people are recording very early speech. So my conclusion is not that this proves that the reliability of the Gospels, but simply <coughs> that it's the sort of thing that does show real information about the way people spoke in the time and place, probably requires tradition, and it's the sort of thing that would happen if people aren't naturally trying very hard. So I think an early Jewish context for the Gospels would really explain the way things are. I want to give more briefly another test, this time the test of geography. One of the things we can say about the four Gospels is that they have quite a bit of knowledge of the geography of the land. Again, rather striking if they were written outside the land, as many people think. <coughs> 
because they happen to know the, na the, the names of little villages in the land, places like Bethphage or Bethany. And they know where the land goes up and down, and you can test them on travelling times. These are not easy pieces of information to get hold of when you consider how difficult it was to travel in the ancient world. Uh, travelling was very expensive and would be done for a reason. So, in other words, to get this sort of information, you can't look it up on the internet, there aren't many people you can ask. To get this sort of information really does require good quality witness um, in order to give you it. We can also say that when we compare the four Gospels with um, the 16 earliest apocryphal Gospels, they do rather well. The four Gospels have 12 to 14 towns each, a total of 23. The best scoring apocryphal Gospel is the Gospel of Philip, which has two town names, one of which is Jerusalem, which is the capital and therefore not a very impressive piece of knowledge, and the other one is Nazareth, which it happens to think is Jesus' middle name. Then we have the Gospel of Peter and the Gospel of the Saviour, which just have one town each, that is Jerusalem, again, the capital, not very impressive, and the next 13, including the Gospel of Thomas, have zero towns mentioned. In other words, again, the apocryphal Gospels can be a very good control sample. This is what happens when people do make up stories later. We can also uh, look again at the whole question of how many words we have per Gospel. I've given you in the four left-hand columns the number of words in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the four Gospels in the New Testament. On the right I give you four, five apocryphal Gospels, Philip, Thomas, Judas, Peter and Mary. Now it's not quite fair on Paul, Peter and Mary, because they don't survive entirely in manuscripts. Maybe if we find some more manuscripts, they'll actually get to be a little bit longer. But you can see on the whole they're shorter. Now Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are on the four left-hand columns. I want you to fix your eyes on those four left-hand columns. And we've just changed slides to the number of place names for gospel. Not quite the same as the number of town names, uh, because of course there are places which aren't towns, places like Golgotha. And what we find is that the um, shape of the columns is basically the same. Here we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, number of words for gospel, number of place names for gospel, number of words for gospel, number of place names for gospel, number of words for gospel, number of place names for gospel. So that when I say give me place names for a thousand words, I find a rather striking thing. That basically all four gospels have five place names per thousand words. Peter seems to get a little bit near them, but remember it's really short and it's not um, therefore a very good control sample. And the four gospels are really pretty long. I mean, not too long for you to read, only a couple of hours each, but they're reasonably long texts. Uh, now the point is this, how can we explain how all four Gospels have five place names per thousand words? They've got very different Greek styles, everyone agrees they're by different authors. Well, let's try this explanation. Luke says to Mark, hey Mark, how many words have you got in your Gospel? Mark goes through very carefully counting them all, which is very difficult because Greek manuscripts at the time didn't have gaps between words, and either there were no lowercase letters or there were no uppercase letters, whichever way you want to view it. Um, so in terms of counting place names and so on, it's quite difficult. And then, of course, Matthew and Luke hear about this, think it's a great idea, and try to mimic that. Well, that would require a sort of very complex conspiracy theory for basically no point because I was the first person to spot this and so, uh, you know, in 2,000 years of not being spotted, then, you know, not very clever. What um, I would suggest to you is this is what we could call a natural pattern. That is not the sort of thing that happens when people try. If people were putting in place names for very similitude to make something sound authentic, that artificial action would cause some to put in too many, some to put in too few. I think this is the sort of thing that happens when people are not trying hard, they're simply writing the same genre of literature. And they're writing with place names when it's relevant. So I think that doesn't prove them to be true, but it does fit very well with them being simply writing in a natural way. So to me that suggests uh, we might um, uh, think that they've got good information. Another test, very briefly, the test of botany. Does anyone here know the story of Zacchaeus? Uh, Zacchaeus in the Bible, a few people know the name. Good, good. Uh, he climbed up a particular sort of tree. What sort of tree was it? Sycamore tree, very good. Uh, some of you have learned that early on. Um, does anyone know what town he's supposed to have been in when he climbed up a sycamore tree? No one? It began with J, but it's not Jerusalem. Jericho. Jericho. Thank you very much, madam. Um, now, th the thing we then ask is, well, Luke records that this man, little man, climbed up a sycamore tree in Jericho. We simply ask the question, 
are there sycamore trees and were there sycamore trees in Jericho? And here we've actually got some people in a sycamore tree in Jericho. Um, now, the, um, the thing about this is, um, this is not the North American sycamore, nor yet the British sycamore. This is Ficus sycamorus when we do our studies on the Greek word. And when we consider a very authoritative source for where exactly um, uh, Ficus sycamorus used to be and now is distributed, we find that it wasn't even in terse uh, Turkey, Greece, or Italy. So someone uh, living in those uh, countries making up a story wouldn't even have heard of them. This is the sort of thing that you get right because either you've been to the place or you've talked to someone who has been. I want to come to one of the alleged miracles of Jesus. This is a story which occurs in all four Gospels. There aren't many things that do occur in all four Gospels. The death and resurrection of Jesus is one of them. And the idea is that Jesus... Uh, was in a fairly um, deserted place, a little bit away from the shops, but near a town, but not quite close enough. And that um, there's uh, 5,000 uh, men and women and children too, they're with him, and he supposedly feeds them with five loaves of bread and two fish. You may or may not believe that, but the point is, this is the way the story goes. And we might want to try and test that particular story. You might think it's not worth testing because it's you know, so ridiculously miraculous. We might start with looking at the numbers. I mean, when you talk about 5,000 people, how would they know there's 5,000? Well, the story in two of the accounts tell us that the people were divided into groups of 50 or 100, which means that for 12 disciples, maybe there's only about eight uh, each to count. So they can just about manage that. Um, but then we have this detail in Mark's Gospel and in John's Gospel that there was something about the grass. It says that uh, there was uh, green grass, or in John's Gospel, there's much grass. Now, as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find that John has a pretty independent narrative from the other ones. Many scholars don't even think he knew about the other sources, and there's a debate about that. But they both mention the grass. Was this just a detail put in in order to make the story look like an eyewitness testimony, um, or was it actually something that happened? Then we have in Mark's Gospel, it simply describes that many people are coming and going at this time, but doesn't explain why. But if we go to John's Gospel, it will tell us that it's Passover time. And we know that Passover was a time when many Jews went on uh, pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So if I plug in the information from uh, John, uh, it fits together with what we have in Mark, that, that would explain why many people are coming and going. Now I'm sure there is never any plagiarism in this um, venerable institution. But my uh, job when I was lecturing in the University of Aberdeen was actually to prosecute plagiarism. And that was very, uh, not, not my full-time job, that was just my part-time pleasure. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I was very mean and always made sure the meetings were first, time in the, first thing in the morning and people would come dressed up in suits with ties and all sorts of things to try and um, impress. But what I found in that particular setting is that there's sometimes a ring of truth about people's story. There were sometimes innocent people. And what you found is that there were details that they couldn't possibly know about in their story that fitted with something that you independently knew. This is the sort of thing you sometimes get in the Gospels. And I think that's the sort of thing we get between Mark and John here. Uh, if you want to say that Mark or John wrote that detail, detail in, in order to make it fit with the other one, the problem is it fits in such a subtle way that the danger is you wouldn't even notice it. Then we find that in John's Gospel, Philip, uh, uh, Jesus asked one of his disciples, called Philip, where to buy bread from, and then also in John's Gospel, Philip and another disciple, Andrew, get involved in the reply. Now, why does Jesus turn to that particular disciple? If we go to Luke's Gospel, who doesn't tell us about that conversation, Luke tells us that the feeding took place near Bethsaida. Again, I see no significance. But if I go back to the beginning of John's Gospel, I find out that Philip and Andrew were from Bethsaida. Now that's a rather striking thing, because if I read through John's Gospel on its own, I see absolutely no significance to why Jesus turned to this particular disciple. However, if I plug in information from Luke's Gospel, suddenly I see a more coherent story, that Jesus turned to a man with local knowledge and asked him where to buy bread from, and that man, along with another man with local knowledge, gets involved in the reply. We could even say the detail in John's Gospel that the little boy provided barley loaves fits exactly with when you just had Passover because you've just had the barley harvest. But then I asked myself the question, would the grass really have been green? So I decided to get a precipitation chart from a nearby town and plug in when Passover would be any of the um, 10 possible years uh, between 26 and 36, 
And what we find is basically you've had six of the greatest months of precipitation leading up to this point. So with the grass being green, you bet. Now, does this mean that I can show that a miracle took place? Of course I cannot. I cannot prove that miracles took place. By the way, you do know you cannot prove anything important in life. Absolutely nothing. Because um, science and maths and, uh, and formal logic may deal with proof. But what you cannot do is prove a value. Values just can't be proven. And you can't prove that anyone loves you. And that seems quite important for most of us, that someone does actually love us. Um, you know, I can't prove that my mother loves me, but I am deeply <coughs> convinced of it. You cannot prove that life has a value in terms of, in a way of science. You can't prove that science is valuable, using science. There's no scientific experiment you can do. So in other words, we have values all the time. This is why I like to say either all of us are religious or none of us are religious. I don't mind which, but, but just for sort of legal reasons, we ought to declare a sort of um, an equal playing ground for everyone. Everyone's either, yeah, everyone's got values to their life that they can't prove. And if you say, I don't have any values, I just think you haven't yet realised you've got values. And it's always good to think about what values you have and why you have them. But what we find uh, is that I cannot prove a miracle. But what I can say is this, the account that many people give of miracles, the idea that miracle stories about Jesus grew up because they were being told uh, in a telephone game. This is one actual analogy that um, uh, Professor Ehrman has, has used, sometimes talking about how stories were told fifth or sixth or 19th hand, as he mentioned uh, in one of his books. Um, what we can say is actually that's not a good explanation for how a story like this arises. Because if stories arise through lack of care, one thing we know about lack of attention to detail is that lack of attention to detail in one area spills over to lack of attention to detail in another. So there isn't really a plausible mechanism in order to have miracle stories arise through lack of attention to detail and lack of care in how you tell them the story, and yet the surrounding cultural details, the fine details, to be preserved intact. So when I consider the Gospels as a whole, I would like to suggest, although I can't prove uh, things to be historical, that the evidence is thoroughly consistent with uh, trusting them. I would also want to say that we need to distinguish between what we can do in history as an academic discipline and the whole question of trust generally in life. What I mean by this is history as an academic discipline can sometimes be a bit like a hedge fund. You know, a hedge fund is set up so that the hedge fund manager doesn't lose. You, you win either way. Basically, with much academic history, you can not lose if you're somewhat sceptical towards things. Um, you lose more reputation for denying something that is true than for um, affirming something that's false. I can give you an ana analogy for this. There were a couple of Oxford scholars one of whom affirmed that the Hitler diaries were genuine when they weren't. That is, you go to his Wikipedia page, you think of his, the profile he's now remembered as, and everyone remembers him as the person who made the terrible blunder, even though he did use some cautious language as he did. There was another Oxford scholar, uh, uh, Sir Godfrey Driver, who when the Dead Sea Scrolls came out, first said they cannot possibly be true. Then he retracted it. But no one really remembers that. It's simply a little blot, uh, but it's a minor detail. People don't really remember him for that mistake. So what we find is that's history, but that's not actually the way we live our lives. The way we live our lives is we are constantly trusting. We can't not trust. And sometimes we're prepared to make some rather substantial um, decisions based on limited evidence. What I mean by this is if I suddenly get a cell phone call, from a voice I've never heard before, who says, this is the police, your child has just been in a ter terrible accident, I want you to come. Well, I might drop whatever I'm doing in order to go. I think I would. Um, I, I may not be able to verify that police person's uh, voice, there may be very little way of actually checking up, but sometimes you need to make big decisions in that uh, spur of the moment, you might drop whatever amazing business deal you're doing and go to the, uh, the hospital you've been told to go to. Um, on basically fairly limited evidence. That's the sort of thing we regularly do um, in life. Because in life we trust. And I think that we need to distinguish between proving something, remembering we can't prove uh, 
even such basic things as that our memories from 10 seconds ago are correct and we're, we're not a mind in a vat. No, you can't prove that sort of thing. But what you can say is we can have very good reasons to trust things. We trust our minds, and I'd also say that we can trust testimony. And so, although I may not be able to prove a particular testimony to the standards that a history department wants to insist on for it to be accepted as part of their corroborated history, because a history department likes to have things corroborated, multiple sources. We can say that in our daily lives, we're regularly acting on something based on one single witness. We turn up in a lecture hall based on one single piece of information we've read. We don't ask for corroboration. So I think that that needs to be factored in when we consider this whole question of trust. I think if the Gospels were written on the basis of uh, stories produced several steps removed from the time and place, we wouldn't get the pattern that they have. Well, that's all I have to say. You've been extremely patient, thank you very much. And there are now, uh, there's time for questions, and our MCs are going to tell us how that's going to work. Thank you. The first question is, have you had times of disbelief and doubt? Mm -hmm. And if so, what did you do? Thank you. It's a great question. Um, when I was in my, uh, what you would call junior year and senior years, um, uh, third and fourth years in a British university, I had uh, quite a lot of doubts because I was being, uh, I was studying the Bible academically and with people who uh, didn't believe it was uh, historically reliable and I had to work through a number of different things and uh, read up on that. Uh, but what I found is that usually the reason why people uh, doubt something is because they've actually um, shifted the burden of proof in an interesting way. Uh, or they, they are setting a bar of proof which is simply in the wrong place. So I, I find that sometimes adjusting those sorts of things uh, to more what we use in everyday life was a helpful thing. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, another question we have is, um, as a scholar of the New Testament, what is your view on the new perspective on Paul made popular in recent years by folks like uh, Tom Wright? Thank you. This is a rather technical question. It's really to do with how someone um, gets saved. And it's not really about the Gospels, it's, it's about what Paul's letters write uh, and uh, the, the traditional uh, view since the Reformation was uh, amongst the Protestants was really that uh, what happens is when someone becomes a Christian, um, God looks at them and uh, sees their um, doesn't see their sin, he sees Jesus' perfect life transferred to them. And so that's what, what's called justification was really about. It was about someone's standing before God. This uh, new perspective that's been advocated by a number of people, including um, E.P. Sanders over at Duke uh, uh, for a number of years, was much more that it was about the group that you belong to. And, I'm, uh, and so that's really what uh, justification was about. And I'm a skeptic of that. Uh, view, I, I would uh, hold to the older view. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah. oh, sorry, my issues. Uh, when people ask, how do they know, how does someone know the Bible is truth, a common answer is, because it's the word of God. What is a so solid argument with proof towards that? Thank you. Um, one of the things we've got to to consider when we think of this word no is how it's actually shifted its meaning in the last couple of hundred years. So nowadays, some people would even say you can't know anything because for them, knowing is like belief magnified up to 100% certainty. And actually, because you never get perfect certainty, you only approach the line of certainty asymptotically, you know, a, a line that never actually meets. So you never actually know anything. Well, to me, that's not a very useful uh, use of the word uh, no. And so I tend to use the word no in a much older way, uh, which is that you know something which is factually correct and which you have um, sufficient warrant to believe. So I would uh, use some of Alvin Plantinga's work here, who's an epistemologist based at Notre Dame, uh, who would talk about warranted belief. And so, uh, one of the things we, we might want to say is, uh, does a belief have adequate grounds um, uh, in, order, in order to be uh, believed? So, 
uh, that's much more what I want to focus on. So how would someone know that the, uh, the, the uh, Bible uh, was true and, and so on? Well, if you came to believe uh, that, let's say, there was a God, in fact, not just a God, uh, the God of the Hebrews, the Jews, was the true God, and that uh, Jesus was his Messiah. You could come to believe that without believing the Bible. You just have to, um, th there'll be certain, you might believe, um, uh, reasons for that belief. You might say, you know, the special preservation of the Jews over many uh, millennia, the um, uh, way there's a certain amount of archaeological co corroboration of the Bible. You might think, well, there are things in the Bible, like it seems that the Bible divides into two sections, the Old Testament and the New, and the Old is written before the New, and there seems to be prophecy. Let's say you, you came to be convinced of that. You might say, well, I've got enough ground. Now I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Then I look at the sorts of things that most of the people who met Jesus seem to say he said, and he seemed to think that the Bible is God's word, and that would be a way into it that isn't quite circular. What you've got to realize is, of course, that Many people, when they're um, judging a truth question like this, are not thinking about the background <coughs> probabilities which come from their worldview. If you're an atheist, no amount of evidence is ever going to make you think that a miracle took place, because you're simply in a universe in which there are no miracles. And so you always will look for another explanation. On the other hand, if you already believe that, let's say, the, the, the God of the Hebrews is the real God, then um, believing that a particular miracle happened which uh, to Jesus Christ in fulfillment of that God's plans um, has already some plausibility to it. So in other words, we've got plausibility structures built in. So a lot of the time when someone presents a case for Christianity, um, the reason a um, modern, um, not atheist, but somewhat skeptical person uh, towards those sorts of things word rejected is actually not that they just got one reason to disbelieve Christianity, they've actually got four or five pretty good reasons. And so what that would mean is someone can come along with a historical argument, but it's, it doesn't really make it within the structure. Um, but what you do have to realise is, of course, the sorts of beliefs that people adopt can be beliefs that come from the wider cultural narrative. So we're in a particular place where the easiest belief to adopt is a fairly, uh, you know, um, sceptical view towards, quote, religion, um, because that's, you know, our, our big cultural narrative. That isn't the big cultural narrative in China at the moment, you know, but that is our big cultural narrative. Um, so, uh, now, you've spoken a lot about your scholarship uh, of the New Testament, and especially the Gospels this evening. Um, have you applied, um, the same, I guess, historical method methodology or scholarship to um, other sacred texts such as our Old Testament or the Torah uh, in the Quran. Yeah, um, so I have looked a little bit at personal names in the Quran, and you can compare, let's say, the Joseph story in the Bible with the Joseph story in the Quran, and you'll find tons fewer names in the Joseph story in the Quran. Um, and some of the Joseph story uh, names in the Bible have got some plausibility. Um, I've also looked at the big argument from personal names in the Old Testament, and you can divide them up into different stages, because the Old Testament records uh, you know, many centuries of history, and the striking thing is the first five books have no names that end in a special sort of IAH that become really common. Names like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hezekiah are really common biblical names in a later stage, but not in the earlier stage. So we do get some stratification of biblical names in the Old Testament that fit with things we can correlate with outside the Old Testament. And what I like about that is it's a very hard thing for someone uh, in the time and place if they're writing at the end of the period to get right, to get names right from 500 or 1,000 years prior to their time. Very Tricky. Easier for us now. Um, can you bring up a few of the strongest arguments against the Gospels that scholars have and how and why those fall through? Thank you. Um, I mean, there's a great book by our, our, our local Bart Ehrman called Jesus Interrupted, uh, which you may have come across, which has got a, a really nice chapter in the middle where he puts uh, some of the best uh, alleged contradictions. 
in the Gospels. I can't remember which chapter it is, but it's a reasonably substantial chapter. And I think he's got a really good selection uh, in there. I think that none of those are actually very conclusive <laughs> um, for me. A lot does depend on the background plausibility you come to judging these sorts of things. Very often when we have ancient narratives, you'll find that two ancient narratives um, don't obviously fit together, but sometimes when you do a little bit more work, you find that they do. It's not just with the Bible, it's actually with things generally. Or if you have um, two witnesses of the same event, often they'll record quite uh, different views, but then you dig down and you find there's a little bit more to it. So uh, I would just want to allow that when we're dealing with ancient sources, we have a certain generosity, and also that we mustn't judge. A, a, when someone says, you know, this is a contradiction, we mustn't say, well, give me the most plausible answer, and let's judge its plausibility. Let's say its plausibility might just be 10%. But if I happen to have six possible answers, each with a 10% plausibility, the likelihood is it's not a contradiction, if you see what I mean. The other thing is, I don't think someone should um, confuse, um, I mean, there, there are a, a couple of different Christian um, options you can take. One would be a, a Christian option, which I prefer, which is that the whole of scripture, which is my preferred term, is completely true. <coughs> there are possibilities that could actually say, the Gospels are basically reliable, and I can defend that position historically without having to defend every detail. So I think what I presented tonight is more a case for trusting the Gospels generally than for trusting them in every specific. Now, I happen to hold the more maximalist case, but I want to say that the lesser case, that you can defend them generally but not specifically, is also a position which shouldn't be rejected. Um, now, this is kind of ties in with the previous question. Um, would you consider yourself, uh, or would you consider the Bible to be uh, inerrant in its entirety? Um, and do you find that to be necessary to, uh, like, to, in, to a Christian worldview uh, of the Bible, or at least important or exclusive to yeah. evangelicalism? Okay, um, let's start with just the word Bible. The word Bible, if you look in a dictionary, has two meanings. And we need to be rather careful about them. There's one meaning that's only really been around since the 13th century, which is the reference to a physical copy of uh, the books. The older meaning, I've actually written an article about this, two articles about this, uh, is the word uh, really coming from the Greek biblia, meaning books. So when I am talking about um, God's word being true or scripture being true, which is the older phrase, what I'm referring to is the content of the books, not a particular translation or copy. Now, some person might say, but how can you believe that the scriptures to be true if you don't have an actual copy of them in front of you, uh, which is perfect? And the answer is very easily, Christians have always done this. Before the time of printing, every single copy was made by hand, and every single copy had errors. So you could talk to a monk in the 12th century, and you could say, well, is the Bible true, and are the scriptures true? And they would say, yes. Um, and is every, you know, can you show me a copy in your monastery which doesn't have a single copying error in? And the answer would be, well, of course I can't. Uh, now, the actual translations we now have are better than any that there were in the Middle Ages, because we don't go through the Middle Ages, we go back beyond <coughs> to the earliest copies that now survive. Um, so it seems to me that the proposition that God speaks in books and gives words that get, then get copied down and that those words are entirely true uh, is something which is very defensible. Uh, but that, to, to defend that, I don't need to defend that every translation that everyone ever makes uh, is, is true in its entirety because the idea of errorlessness or inerrancy is really um, a characteristic of God. Um, if, um, so the, the Christian idea and the Jewish idea is that God is someone who's completely truthful and you can trust. And in order for that to work, you'd need to believe, of course, that that God never really uh, you know, makes mistakes and, and, and so on. So that's really what the Christian belief is about. It's a statement about God and God leaving words that then can uh, uh, be read. Um, that's not quite the same as saying... Um, you know, one particular translation is perfect. Now, there is a view that says, well, I mean, one person said, if you had a glass of water 
with one drop of urine in, would you drink it? And the answer is probably no. Uh, <laughs> depends how much someone paid. Uh, but, so the idea is there that the Bible is a bit like a magic spell, a magic book. If one bit in a bit of translation is wrong, the spell doesn't work. But I don't think the Bible is remotely like that. I think the Bible is a very powerful uh, message. Uh, and so that if one bit in your copy isn't perfect, that doesn't mean nothing will happen. I mean, it's a bit like saying, well, I missed some of the words he said tonight in his strange English accent, so therefore I'm not going to take any notice of anything he said. Well, I'd regret that if you, if you did take that position. Um, uh, I, I think that often we can miss something in a conversation. That's fine. So there, there can be mistranslations or misunderstandings in people's Bibles. Um, that's okay. We don't have the same angst when we think about Dostoevsky being translated or Homer. Um, and it's basically the same thing. You can, you can get ancient literature and you can click through. We've even, a uh, place I worked in our house in Cambridge, stepbible.org, we produced a Bible where you can click on the English and get straight through to the Greek and Hebrew. There's a transparency there, all for free, stepbible.org. Um, and uh, soon in an act near you. And, and the thing is there, that in terms of this idea that there's a great distance between original texts and, and, and manuscripts and what a person can see today, there really isn't. There's a, a lot of information you can get. Long answer, sorry. Kind of going off, off that a little bit more, do you contradict things, for instance, differences between story, the same story within the Gospels? Does that necessarily disprove validity, for example? What is the significance between the different accounts of Jesus' death within the Gospels? Thank you. I think we need to be slightly careful about this word contradiction. Um, Dickens begins his tale of two cities, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Now that formally is a contradiction. Most of us, although we may not have made it to the end of the book, won't have closed the book at that stage. Uh, because we uh, want, you know, we're, we're intrigued and we want to read on and we want actually to hear further qualifications and explain how exactly that is the case. And uh, a formal contradiction occurs regularly in our speech. Someone says, do you, um, you know, like such and such? And you say, well, yes and no. Do you like ice cream? Yes, I like the flavour. Do you no, I don't like what it does to my body. You know, and so you can have that, maybe you like both, but um, <laughs> the, the point is we can do that. And I think we've just got to allow an ancient text like the Bible or any other ancient text, the Quran or anything like that, to have enough space. I think there's a sort of sceptical rush in, let's find all the problems that there are with it. Uh, and we've got to allow them to use words in more than one way. So really, technical vocabulary begins with Aristotle um, in the um, you know, th uh, 300s BC, where he decides we're going to have one word going with one concept. Uh, and th that... But before then, there wasn't really that notion. And even after then, it didn't kick in for a long time. And if you still use that today, you're going to have a vast vocabulary. So in order to lower your vocabulary and just speak in a simpler way, we use words with multiple values. And guess what? Bible writers do the same. Are they allowed to do that? So, you know, sometimes I think some writers, even like John, deliberately use contradictions in order to make you think further. So John, John's Gospel will have Jesus saying he wasn't sent into the world to judge it, and then he'll say, in the same Gospel, for judgment I was sent into the world. <laughs> you know, and you get a whole list of those sorts of things. Um, and when you read through John's Gospel, you actually, as you read the literature more carefully, you begin to think, ah, He's getting me to think more deeply about the message. So I just think that sometimes um, people infer from a formal contradiction to there can be no underlying truth. And I think that's rather uh, unfortunate. Uh, okay. Um, now, what is your personal view on the historicity of the creation story found uh, in the Old Testament text? Yeah. Thank you. I know nothing about science. I mean, virtually zero. So I really can't. Uh, uh, yeah, comment in detail there. What I can say is the areas that I'm able to investigate about the Bible and its history, I have found to be reliable. So I am prepared to trust in the areas that I don't know, and I, I talk to friends who do know about that sort of stuff, and they say it works out, but I don't have any specifics on that. Really, if you're interested in that area, you should probably go back to, I think John Lennox spoke here a while ago, just get anything by John Lennox, professor in Oxford, very clever guy, even though he comes from the other place. <laughs> so, unfortunately, I believe it is time for us to wrap up.
Before we go, I think you just gave us a good recommendation. Are there any other recommendations you have about apologetics, the Christian worldview, people seeking to know more about the reliability of the Gospels? Any reading recommendations that you might have? Uh, yeah, I mean, dep depends, you know, what level you're at, but I'd say it doesn't take long to read the Gospels. Um, you can read the whole Bible through in 66 to 70 hours. Uh, you can probably read the Gospels in about nine or ten hours. Uh, so not very long, uh, very worthwhile, and, and, and you know, just start um, start from there. I mean, I, I think it's part of your intellectual growth uh, to make sure you've done that. Uh, most churches don't read the Bible anymore, so uh, don't uh, just get it from a church. You'll actually have to do it on your own. Maybe maybe ask someone to read it with you for fun. Have a read. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.